Well, good morning. Most of you, I think, know who I am, but I am Joanne Moon Chandon, known mostly by Jody, and uh, I've been here at Calvary for 67 years. <laughs> They just can't seem to get rid of me. <laughs> I've taught from the cradle roll up to the older people in my age. So this morning I'm going to be reading in Joshua and uh, the sixth chapter and verses 1 through 25. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho unto you, unto your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sh the, hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight up. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of... And he ordered the people, All advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests and who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voice. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner except that on the day they circled the city seven times, the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city, the city and all that is in it. Are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies that we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord 
and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold in the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men. Joshua had sent as spies as Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. All that time Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho, at the cost of his firstborn son, will he lay its foundation at the cost of his youngest? Will he set up his gates? So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate that. Well, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that story, but if you're not, as Jody was reading about the story of Jericho. And we'll, we'll get into the background here in just a minute. But in that story, you've got Joshua, who is now leading, now leading the Israelite nation. And so in this process, God has given them some instructions, and that was at the very beginning. But as God was giving this nation instructions, one of the things that's important when you get, in, get instructions is you have to respond. A response is required. And if you think about it, each and every day of our lives, we respond to things. Now, sometimes we respond the ways we like, sometimes we don't. One of the things I think that's hardest about this time right now is our face shows so much of our response, and you can't really see it. That's the one thing about a mask. You can't, is somebody smiling? What's going on? Kind of the feedback you're getting. Also, our our words, the tone, you can tell. Are we upset? Are we irritated? Are we joyous? Are we happy? All of these things are ways we respond. One of the things I found interesting, though, have you you ever been in a conversation? And maybe this is, I've done this, so I can't say just parent to child, but somebody says something, and the immediate response is, huh, or what? And then they answer. And it's like, well, did you not hear or what? It was your mouth just speaking before your brain caught up? I mean, what, what's kind of going on? Okay. So we respond to all sorts of things, and sometimes we can't understand why we respond the way we do. But our response is critical to relationship. If you want positive, healthy relationships, then guarding your responses and making sure you respond is absolutely necessary, or they will be dysfunctional and unhealthy. But see, the fact is, it's the same in our relationship with God. The way we respond impacts our relationship with God. And the greatest weapon that God has given us to respond is worship. And so how we respond with worship is going to impact what we see God do. And so we're going to dig into this story a little more and look at the battle of Jericho. But before we do, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for these stories that we can, can read and realize as we're reading history, the history of this nation, Israel, but really it's not just history, it's, it's his story, it's your story, Lord. And we thank you for it. And Lord, we, we thank you also for the places that are, are hard, that we don't always understand. And Lord, I, I pray that we will be faithful to wrestle to ask questions, to dig in where we're not sure. Lord, I know you can handle that. And so help us to be faithful to do that. But I just ask that you would speak to us now. There's a lot of ways we can respond to the things that are going on and even things that we're dealing with right now. 
But Lord, the greatest response, the, the weapon you've given us is to respond with worship. And so I just ask that you would move right now, that you would speak to us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when you back up just a little bit and think about the background of of what's going on in the nation of Israel. I mean, there's a lot that's already happened in the first five chapters of the book of Joshua. But getting to the end of Numbers, Moses has died. Moses is the man. He is a friend of God. He has physically changed in appearance that he... The glory of God would shine upon him. The fact that he would wear a veil because the people were like, God, we don't want to get near Moses. And so this guy is gone. And so imagine Joshua stepping into this. And it says that Moses laid his hands on Joshua. And part of what God had given Moses was transferred to Joshua. And if I was Joshua, I'd be like, thank God, I need some of this. Because he's been with this group the whole time out of their Exodus. He was actually one of the 12 spies who were sent in, sent in to spy out the land, the land that God had promised, the land flowing with milk and honey, the 12 spies who were sent out. But what happened was when they came back, 10 gave a negative report. And so because of their lack of faith, because of their disobedience, when God had already said, I've given it to you, you just need to prepare to go get it. Because of that, God said, this generation will not go in. Only Caleb and Joshua will go in. And so that Joshua is now the leader of Israel. But see, we find all that interaction in Numbers 13. This is just a brief part of that story. Beginning of verse 27 says, This was the report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey, here is the kind of fruit it produces. So notice right here, this is great. Someone's like, yeah, God was right. Land flowing. Here's what we found. But, but, verse 28, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. See, they could see what's there, but their response is not worship. Their response is fear. The response is not, we've got the God who brought us out of Egypt. We've got the God who parted the Red Sea. We've got the God who put manna on the ground. The God who brought water out of a rock. This is the God we've got, but no, they're too big. And to be honest, don't you kind of look at that and go, what were they thinking? But then how often is that us? We look at our life and we see the giants in our life. And we go, God, you can't do it. We respond in fear as well. And see, most likely, Jericho was one of those cities, fortified, walls. They saw it. And so imagine, to me, some of the irony of God's like, okay, you thought this city was scary. Wait and see what I'm going to do with it. And I love that. Because everything we think is too big, God's like, that's nothing for me. I can handle that. You just need to trust me. You need to respond with worship. That needs to be the response. And so now... This nation, after generation is gone, has an opportunity to get it right. An opportunity to get it right. But there's some challenges to this. And I want to give you a couple of things that I hope will help us as we respond to the things in our daily lives. So if you're a note taker, there's some things on the back of your worship guide or you can grab the notes online. But part of what we need to understand is we respond with worship. We respond with worship even when God doesn't make sense. We respond with worship even when God doesn't make sense. Well, God doesn't make sense. See, if you read the book of Numbers, they've done all the counting. They've looked at their nation. They know how many warriors they've got. They're set for battle. But I can tell you what the instructions they were just given, this is not battle strategy. This is not, hey, we're going to ambush them. We're going to go around here. We're going to set up a garrison over here. This is not what they're being given. Let's look back at verse 3 of Joshua Six. It says, you and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. What are we going to do? Are we going to stomp them to death? I mean, what's that going to do when we walk around the city? Verse 4, seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests 
blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight in to the town. See, if you're thinking about a military, this is not military strategy. This is more ritual in nature. This is more of a processional. This is honestly worship. This is not war. This is more band than it is battle. And I think if you were a general, if you were someone who was in the military, you'd be like, this, what? What is this going to do? But see, God doesn't make sense to us. God's ways are not our ways. And see, that's what actually should make sense. It should make sense to us that God doesn't make sense because he's God and we're not. And see, when you read the book of Isaiah, in chapter 55, verse 8, it says what might be a familiar verse, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. See, your ways are not my ways. So what may not make sense to you, you respond with worship. Respond with an understanding that I'm going to do things you're not going to totally get. I mean, you go back to Jesus and what he did. They were waiting for the Messiah who was going to come on this earth, reign and rule and conquer the Romans. And what does Jesus do? He's crucified by the Romans. See, God's ways are not our ways. And so we respond with worship even when God doesn't make sense. Because, see, honestly, we generally respond in one of two ways. The way we respond each day is, okay, I'm going to make my plans and hope they succeed. That's my plan. Or we make our plans and then we ask God to bless them. God, this is a good plan. I came up with this. Can you bless it, please? Instead of maybe saying, God, what's your plan? God, what would you like for us to do? But see, the beautiful thing to me is a lot of times, and it, this frustrates me, people say, well, if you believe in Jesus, if you follow the Bible, you, you just got bi- blind faith. You don't believe in anything. No, we are a thinking people. We are a studying people. We are a people that wrestle with faith. But see, it's not just that we're blindly taking this. Look at verse 2. And what God has already said, God said, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. See, these guys didn't just come up with a plan and say, this is what we think is going to work. God has spoken. And see, one of the beautiful things, I love the language in here, it uses the phrase have given. That's a past tense. See, the idea of this statement, and I love this, is that actions are seen as completed, even if they're present or future. God's saying it's done. I've given you Jericho. Go get it. Victory is already won. See, and it's a matter of how often we seem to be acting like we're fighting for victory instead of fighting from victory. We've already won. And that's what he was trying to tell them. Victory is assured, and I love what Paul says as he talks about victory in 1 Corinthians 15. And at the end of 15, he's talking about death, and a lot of times we think that's the end. But in 57, he says, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the things we're wrestling with today, and I know we've been through a pandemic and so on, and the concerns with COVID, I don't know about you, I know people who have had it. I know people who have not survived and people who have. But you know what? One problem I know every single person on the planet has, it's sin. That's the one problem we're all dealing with. So whether you get COVID or not, that's the one issue we all need to be focused on. And so we begin to take our eyes off of that because at the end, it's really not going to be what ended your life. It's going to be what's going to happen on the other side. Did you know Jesus? Did you know Jesus? Because the fact is, and I thought it was kind of funny, you couldn't have heard Jody. She was, when I was helping her, she's like, this is what happens when you get old. And I was like, you know what? I think we all need help no matter what. But see, this body is decaying. And guess what? You're going to get a new one. You know Jesus, you're going to get a new one. See, victory is assured. But we've got to make sure we respond 
with worship, even when it doesn't make sense. Because I have no doubt. Some of you are sitting in here right now asking, God, what are you doing in my life? God, what is going on? God, I don't even see you at work. Where are you? And see, I believe God gently says, I'm here. I'm doing things you may not see. I'm doing things you may not understand, but I'm here. And see, when you worship, when you respond with worship, it turns your eyes to the one who's in control of all those circumstances. And see, there may be some walls in your life that you don't understand how you're going to face. And he says, just wait, I'm going to knock them down. I'm going to knock them down. And you're just going to walk right on in. And just wait for that. That's going to be a beautiful thing. But it's important to understand that when God doesn't make sense, we need to respond with worship. But there's also a second thing we need to make sure we do. And that's when we respond with worship, we understand that that is an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience. See, last week I shared kind of a, a phrase about worship. And the idea behind worship is it's not about people. It's not about music. It's about giving God the glory and honor He deserves. That's what worship is about. And what that means is an act of worship is to obey. It's to do what He says. God says it. That settles it. See, I think that if you've heard that phrase before, there's often a middle line in there. It says, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And the fact is, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. God said it. That settles it right there. And so we've got to obey. And see, it may not make sense why God is leading you to do something. I mean, of all the things, when you look at the strategy, you look at all the things that God has used. I mean, he took, I can't remember if I'm getting the story right. I think it was Gideon, where he had an army and he said, no, you just need to take 300. Okay, so you want us to have less men and go out and fight? Yes, because God's saying, I want to show you that I'm in charge of this battle. See, God does things that just don't make sense to us. But when we respond with obedience, when we obey, we get to see God work. Because, see, there's some cool things in the story I think we might miss. And depending upon your translation, it might have seen, you've seen the word trumpets and the word horns in there. See, typically your trumpets are, it's a battle. It's a signal. Hey, get ready. We're going to battle. It's a signal to the camp. Hey, Attention needs to be drawn. We may be packing up the camp and moving now. That's to get your attention. But you know what horns are for? Horns are for celebration. See, they're blowing the horns because we already won. And see, we need to, in some ways, blow that metaphorical horn. And the cool thing is, the word that's common for horn is jobel, which is where we get the word jubilee. There's a celebration going on here. But see, they, don't, they won't get to see this unless they follow the instructions and unless they obey. And I can imagine there were some doubts going on. Can you imagine just they're kind of lining up, and I don't know if it was two by two. I don't know how they marched around the walls, but can you imagine like Jehoshaphat and Jachiel standing next to each other going, dude, what are we doing? Man, I got my spirit. We're all walking around. Why are we not fighting? But no, verse 10 What is the instructions? Don't say a word. Don't say a word because God knew there would probably be whiners and complainers. He's probably like, oh, it's it's a Baptist church. No, I'm just kidding. He's probably like, I know it's a church. There's going to be somebody complaining. Somebody's going to say something. And he's like, be quiet. Just be quiet. Okay? Just be quiet. Focus. We see the seventh day. Seventh day. Remember seven. Remember that number. Completeness. Complete. It's finished. What's about to be? Complete victory. Complete victory is coming. And then they get the signal. Shout. A shout, a hallelujah. Let it out. And the walls come down. Verse 20, it says, when the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed. And the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Man, I can't imagine that when they're, they're marching around. And I, I wonder if it's they kept marching and shouting or they stopped. And I don't know. Just imagine the, uh, just the look on their face. And then they're like, oh, we're supposed to go. You know, I just, I don't know. I can't imagine what they're seeing. 
But see, I wonder in that moment when God says, okay, go, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready to obey? Do we take God's word seriously? God has given them instructions to follow, and you know what? God has given us instructions to follow. Do we take God's word seriously? Do we do what it says? You see, the fact is there are hard places in God's word. There are places that are hard. There are places that are uncomfortable. Matthew 18 is one that comes to mind because it's a section that talks about when there's an issue, there is sin, there's something going on with a brother or sister, what do you do? You go to them. That means confront. It's a confrontation. I know some people like to say carefrontation. Okay, that makes it sound nicer, but you know what? You're still confronting someone. And see, I've sat down with leaders, leaders who would say, I'm not going to go talk to them because it won't work. They won't listen. And you know what? It's not about if they respond or not. It's about you being obedient. Are you going to do what God's word says? And see, the beautiful thing is when you go to someone, it's not because you're out to get them. And their scripture tells us you check your heart. You need to examine yourself because when you go to another brother or sister, the fact is it's about love and that you want restoration. And see, one of the things I think we have have missed probably more than anything is being zealous for the unity of God. The unity of God's people that we have got to be one, that there cannot be anything between us and we've got to deal with it. Now, there are places and times where Scripture tells us you just need to overlook something. There are times where maybe we get irritated with something. You need to overlook, but when there is sin, we don't overlook that. We deal with it because we love each other, because we also don't want to see a brother or sister walk away. We don't want to see a brother or sister hurting themselves. Because every time God says don't in his word, he's saying don't hurt yourself. That's all you're going to get from sin is destruction and pain. But see, will we obey Will we run in when God lets the walls down? Because see, it's very clear in John 14. Jesus' words, he says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. In John 14, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will keep them. You will obey them. What a test that is. Do I really love Jesus? Or is it, well, Jesus, I love that one verse. Or, man, that's a great passage. I really like that one. Or this is my favorite book, but you know what? I stay out of those books because I don't know what's going on there. Or there's things I don't want to obey. That's not really experiencing the love. And what that really may give evidence of is a lack of relationship. That's what Jesus came for. That's what Jesus died for, is for you and I to have a relationship with him. See, Jesus didn't die for us to build a building. Jesus didn't die for us to create a denomination. He didn't, us, he didn't die for us to have these big groups or whatever it is or feel good about ourselves. He died because he loves you. And what he wants you to experience is all that he has. John 10, 10 says, an abundant life, life to the full. He died for you to experience that. But see, you won't experience that unless you know him. And what that means is there first has to come a point in time where you say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I realize the greatest problem I have is sin. Sin is I keep walking my own way. Sin is I think I'm in charge. Sin is I'm the one making the plans and hoping they're going to succeed, but I'm just ignoring you. And any time we think we can be the God of our lives, man, we make terrible gods. We make terrible gods. There is only one God. And it's not you and I. But see, when we surrender, when we come into relationship, the beautiful thing is you begin to get to know one who calls you by name. One who says, I love you. And see, John 10 also talks about him being the shepherd. And what happens with the shepherd? The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And see, I wonder, do you know God's voice? Do you know what God sounds like? And see, when you know his voice, I can tell you it's a lot easier to obey. Doesn't mean it's always easy. But when you know it's the loving voice of Jesus, 
then that's one you want to follow. And you can know him, you can trust him, and obey. And that's a beautiful thing. But see, will we respond with worship? Because when we worship, that brings us into God's presence. And see, in his presence, that's where we're going to find peace and calm and joy. But that means we have to respond with worship even when God doesn't make sense. We have to respond with worship and we obey. But the hard thing is, is we often will trust ourselves. And it's kind of like the guy who was a new pilot, but he wasn't real experienced at flying. And he was flying on a cloudy day. And one of the things he didn't have as much experience with was what's called an instrument landing. And what that means is you can't see things, but you follow the instruments. You use the instruments to guide you in. And so as he's getting ready to land, he's starting to get panicky, worried about what's going on. And all of a sudden, over his headset, he can hear, and the tower's talking to him. And the tower's a little bit irritated with him and says, you follow the instructions. Don't worry about the obstructions. We'll take care of those. You follow the instructions. And see, the problem is you and I, we spend too much time looking at the obstructions, looking at the things that we see in front of us instead of realizing God has given us the instructions. We need to follow him. And see, when we respond with worship, we follow his instructions. And that is the greatest weapon we could ever have. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have given us the instructions, Lord. Your word tells us that there's a problem with us. And I know there's times we don't want to hear that. But Father, if we look in the mirror, we look around us, we can see there's a problem. And Father, what is broken inside, you've already provided the answer. And the answer is Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that today, Lord, we all worship something or someone. And I pray that you would help us to turn our eyes towards you and worship you. And that may be for someone today, it's the first time they just say, Jesus, I need you. It may be a simple prayer of Jesus, help me. I don't know what to do. Whatever it is, I pray that today would be that day of beginning of surrender because when we worship anything but you it's never going to work and Lord I just pray for those who have already said that they need you, who have already surrendered to you and have that relationship with you Jesus I pray that today might be a day where they stop looking at some of the walls in their life, they start looking at some of the obstructions and focus on you and following your instructions. But whatever it is, maybe it's some things they just need to surrender, lay down and say, I got no plan for this. Nothing's working. Jesus, help me. Today, you might just remind them that you're here, you're close, and you haven't forgotten them. Whatever it is, Lord, I know you're waiting for us to respond and help us to respond with worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.